I'm a doctor in Melbourne. Vaccinations alone are not going to be enough. We still clearly have issues with hotel quarantine. We need input from occupational hygienists, aerosol experts and ventilation engineers. Why is there not national guidance which accepts the reality that airborne transmission is an important mode of spread for this virus and adopts the precautionary principle to protect workers from the airborne spread of this virus with fit tested N95 masks and other measures? Tony Blakely. I agree. Um, but there's been a kick in the pants in the last couple of days whereby we've seen the aerosolisation for a nebulizer. We've seen it in the Park Royal, I think it was, where it went from one room to the corridor to the next room. You cannot deny that aerosol transmission is happening. So that has to now be history. And therefore we need to be doing, sure, N95 masks, but they're not that comfortable to wear. So we need to think about the whole hierarchy of controls you can put in quarantine. Pick a hotel that's got plenty of space. Find a hotel that's got the ventilation such that there's a 10 times per hour turnover of the air in it. All those sorts of things to get the ventilation going. Take the security guards off the corridor if you've got CCTV. And then, yes, those protective things for the workers in there and the staff, like the mask, the goggles, all the rest of it when they are going to the door of those hotel rooms. It's a whole cascade of events. Whether you could make everybody in a hotel wear an N95 mask if they're not in close proximity to somebody, that might be asking too much because they are somewhat uncomfortable to wear. But I completely agree with you. It's time for federal guidance around aerosol and its impact on quarantine. And we need three things with quarantine. First, get as much of it as we can out to the regional places like Howard Springs, where it's my textbooks in public health medicine said that's how you do it before COVID. CBD hotels, which we're going to have to keep using for a while because we've got limited capacity. They need to be improved through the measures I've talked about and vaccinate the staff in those quarantine facilities as quickly as possible. But I agree with your sentiment. Nick Coatsworth. I mean, I think one of the things we've got to be very clear on is that it has been recognised since day zero of the pandemic uh, that aerosols can be generated and there wasn't really a hospital in the country that would have used a nebulizer in its emergency department after the pandemic was declared. So that is something that's been known um, and known for the past 12 months. There is a live debate about the extent to which uh, COVID-19 is transmitted via the aerosol route, via aerosols of COVID-19 that are inhaled. Aaron, but when we, you're shaking your head when, furiously when, at this, but we're just, I was almost, it, all, go I'm on, almost Nick, done. Go I'm almost on. done. We just need to look at the numbers for hotel quarantine, the most successful program in the world. 250,000 Australians returned through hotel quarantine. 3,000 people had COVID-19 in hotel quarantine, and a handful of breakthroughs, which we are learning from every time and we're in a cycle of continuous improvement where the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee is looking at every single case and looking at the controls that Tony's, uh, Tony's described. And so announced I think it we're today in... where AHPPC each week is going to start their meeting off on this very question, which is great. However, one point, Nick, is as the droplets we controlled easier because that was 1.5 metres. So the spread that's happening in hotels and other places due to droplets is probably very low now. And that means the remaining transmission is probably more aerosol based and even more so now with the more transmissible variants coming in. So it's an emerging problem for us that we need to address. I agree with you actually that hotel quarantines work pretty well. I, the problem I, I here is that if one virus gets out and starts another Melbourne second wave, that's a big problem. The, there's there's no debate. Um, there, there has been clear and compelling uh, evidence from the start of this pandemic. In fact, the Chinese, from the get-go, basically acknowledged that this was aerosol transmission um, by far, and it was based on their own experience with SARS. So Nick Coatesworth's wrong? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I've, I've published on this, so, you I know, think it's all I good. I think Nick said there was aerosol transmission. I think I said there was aerosol transmission. I think I'm taking, I'm taking issue on this that it's a debate, and, you know, we're 14 months into this, um, and we've had real uh, lack of um, movement on acknowledging the fundamentals of disease transmission. So if you don't acknowledge that, you know, this is spread through the air, 
through a mixture of droplets as well as aerosols. It's a continuum. You know, you can't really slice where a droplet, what a droplet is and what an aerosol is. It's kind of a spectrum. Um, if you can't even acknowledge that, then you can't prevent it. And I can speak you know, about this because I'm a healthcare worker, right? I'm a doctor. I see patients in emergency. I see patients on the wards. And for the first six months of last year, it was scary. It was scary. We were getting surgical masks and we were told that that's all you're going to get. And of course, the second wave came in to Victoria and healthcare workers started falling like flies. All right. So we had um, accelerating infections in multiple hospitals as that second wave took up. And in the end, we had 4,100 healthcare workers um, who were infected. And it took hundreds and hundreds of healthcare workers to get infected for hospitals to then you know, introduce N95 respirators. And fit testing is something I campaigned with along with some colleagues. And uh, you know, we have now got fit testing. It took till September for that to come in. And I got my fit test done last week. So I'm grateful but it's not exactly an A+. Plus. I think we probably have to acknowledge, though, that it's only really a debate from the side that thinks that people like me didn't acknowledge aerosol transmission. Now, I'm also a doctor. I'm a respiratory-trained infectious disease physician. Um, my wife's a respiratory physician. She does aerosol-generating procedures all the time. I agree with every single thing that Michelle said. It is a continuum. Um, there is an element of airborne transmission. There's actually no disagreement here. So what we need to move on to now is getting out there and getting our healthcare care workers vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine and then the AstraZeneca vaccine um, so that our healthcare system is actually not overburdened in the way that other healthcare systems have been overburdened. Just to bring it back to the question of the vaccine, which is what we're here to talk about tonight, is there a threat if the South African strain becomes a problem in Australia that this will get ahead of us? Because, in effect, we are in a fortress in Australia through the hotel quarantine system. If we're now saying that things are changing uh, such that it's different to what it was when we first began and although it worked very well for a time, do we actually need to be reassessing whether what we're doing in hotel quarantine works now for the current conditions? We are reassessing it. Uh, Tony mentioned it, I mentioned it, the AHPPC, the Chief Health Officers, are reassessing it all the time. But we can't... Um, we, this South African variant and what we do with our vaccination policy, the World Health Organisation came out today and emphasised that the AstraZeneca vaccine um, can and should be rolled out for adults over the age of 16. Um, South Africa will be using the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, I'm sure our regulator is going to be talking to the South African Nick, you regulator. Don't know that. To, so, to hang on, South that. Africa have actually paused rollout of the AstraZeneca. I haven't heard that they're South actually Africa using are actually it. using the, as the AstraZeneca vaccine. They're going to follow the hundred thousand people that next get it. Salim Abdul Karim within the context of a trial. So Salim Abdul Karim, who's leading that trial, who I know extremely well, uh, will be looking closely at what the effect will be on the hundred thousand. At the same time, they'll start using Johnson & Johnson. But South Africa are in the middle of a major pandemic with 85% of their strains being South African variant and thousands and thousands of people dying a day. So they're going to get the answers on that. And I think what we've got to be sort of have to come to terms with here is the changing information we're going to get. You know, um, coronavirus is an RNA virus. It will mutate. It hasn't mutated because of vaccines. I just want to clarify that, because there hasn't been enough. This mm. all appeared before vaccines. And I should say the other major mut mutation that we've seen far more in Australia is the one that originated in the UK, and we're not seeing any, any issues with that one, with the vaccine in preliminary... In preliminary uh, yeah, um, but the, the, the UK variant has actually also picked up um, a particular mutation which is found on the South African variant. This goes back to my earlier point, which is that all these variants are essentially figuring out how to become more contagious yeah, that's and virology they're trying, 101. right yeah. and ha and try to you know evade vaccines. So what I'm saying here is that you know we have signals coming from clinical trials, Novavax, Johnson and Johnson, and now AstraZeneca that there may be a problem with um, the vaccines because they were essentially developed using the original strain, right? Um, but now this has mutated again and and. I think, you know, we need to stay ahead of the game as a country because there is every possibility that the AstraZeneca vaccine will be rolled out to 10 million adults and we may still end up being vulnerable when we relax our international borders and allow people in. 
um, because the variants will come in. So, and you know, I feel that that is a population level experiment which has a uh, high stakes attached to it. And personally, I'm not comfortable with so, that approach at all. Uh, uh, let's let's cut to the chase here. <laughs> so, I think Australia did an amazing job six months ago at backing a range of vaccines, and it would be hyper hypocritical to criticise that now. We've got enough of the Pfizer to do most of our first phase of people. Let's get that done. We can then reassess what's happening at that point as to whether then we then bring in the AstraZeneca for the next tranche of people. We've got some time. Let's get the Pfizer rolled out and then we can reassess. At that point, there'll be a decision to be made as to whether the AstraZeneca is still covering enough or not. And if it's on the borderline and we use the AstraZeneca, and I'm the one who gets an AstraZeneca, and I need to have another dose next year because it gets updated to cover the next virus wave, the next lot of mutations, that's fine. But then, Tony, why that's not just fine. start with a highly efficacious vaccine in the, in, from well, the beginning? How about we start with Pfizer or Moderna or Novavax? But, but every even? country's asking that question. That comes right back to Mohammed's question right at the beginning, is if we've got limited um, mRNA vaccines of high efficacy and other countries are screaming out for them, I think... It's not a bad it's, thing. It's not just mRNA, though. So here's the deal. Just with, so with our audience is clear, you're talking about Pfizer, Pfizer and, and Moderna. Here. Yeah, Pfizer so, and Moderna. So Pfizer just yesterday or the day before announced that they have slashed their vaccine batch production from 110 days down to 60. They also announced, and this was on an investor call, right, so this is reliable, credible evidence, that they were going to be delivering 200 million doses to the US two months ahead of schedule. Fantastic. So that is fantastic <laughs> for the United States. But what I'm saying is that we don't this does not make... sound like a company that is struggling with supply. But that we don't need to decide that tonight or tomorrow. Let's roll out the Pfizer doses we've got. And as we're getting to the point where we need to be deciding what we need to actually use in the next tranche, we can pivot away from AstraZeneca or stay with AstraZeneca. OK, that's can a great idea. No, that's what I've been discussion. saying. Can I sort of bring it bring back, it back to, to the <laughs> principles here? Because <laughs> I'm getting a bit bloody confused, to be honest, and I think if I am, um, we probably all are. We've, we've got to come back to the objectives of this vaccination program, and that is that we want to prevent severe disease and death we want to stop our ICUs being overwhelmed. We want to protect our most vulnerable people. And we can do it with the vaccines we've got. And most importantly, we can do it with a vaccine that we're producing on our own shores, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine. Tony's absolutely right. I will likely get the Astra vaccine. You'll likely mm -hmm. get the Astra which vaccine. Which is fine. It's great. We are likely to get another vaccine in 2022 as well. But let's use the vaccines that we've purchased. They do stop severe disease. We will get Novavax. We will have access to other vaccines like uh, the Janssen vaccine down the track. This debate about the variants and looking at every study every day, like, it's just going to become confusing for the public and it, it needn't be. We're going to have a safe, effective vaccination campaign. So, so to that point then, Sharon Lewin, do we face a particularly unique set of circumstances in that the virus is evolving as they do, the science is evolving very quickly as well, you're all saying we've got to question it, we've got to make sure we, we test everything and look at everything constantly. At the same time, you have a public that wants very clear, simple answers and certainty. So does this pose a problem in that we've got to be actively curious and sceptical to some degree about the science whilst also accepting what Nick says, it's all going to be OK? <laughs> Um, well, in brief, I think it's all going to be OK. We've got um, two vaccines that are highly effective and it's an actual medical miracle that we've got those yeah. vaccines in under a year. It's extraordinary and know that they're safe. And I think we also need to recognise that Australia's in a fabulous position, but winter is coming and we're in a, you know, and winter is coming and we know that um, coronavirus likes spreading in winter. So we really shouldn't keep waiting. We've got these two vaccines now. We know from big studies and from real-world evidence of rolling them out, they work. We will have Pfizer vaccine at the beginning, but the Pfizer vaccine will come in over 12 months, so we can't just... We're not going to get those 20 million doses up front. So I think using two is completely fine and that over time we will have other vaccines, as Nick just said. We will have the Novavax vaccine. We will have new iterations of both Pfizer and AstraZeneca. So I think we have to 
sort of focus on what we're trying to achieve here, stopping hospitals get overrun and getting a large percentage of people vaccinated as we come up to winter. But Australia has been, you know, really well shielded from, you know, those kinds of losses of, you know, hospitalisations and, and deaths relatively. We, it hasn't been smooth sailing, I agree. But, you know, so I think what I'm hearing from my own patients and from some of my colleagues is they're asking me, I, they'd like the Pfizer vaccine. They understand that there is a difference between an efficacy of 95% and an efficacy of 63%, okay? It just means you're gonna get fewer breakthrough infections, right? 5% versus 40%. There is a significant difference here. And I feel that the Australian public are not being leveled with. Um, you know, and this speaks to this issue of equity. Australia's approach is a hybridized approach where 10 million adults will be getting a highly efficacious vaccine in Pfizer, safe, um, the other 10 million will be getting a safe vaccine, which is moderately e efficacious in AstraZeneca. And what I can't is reconcile... Is it fair to say the public's not being levelled with? I mean, the, the, I, the, the, the government, p folks yeah, like Nick but, are turning up and answering I, every single right, question that's put. Right, but when I hear messaging like they're highly effective va vaccines, that's not correct. Um, there is a highly effective vaccine in Pfizer, Moderna, Novavax, and there is a moderately efficacious vaccine in... Um, AstraZeneca. So there is nuance here, and I think that that needs to be conveyed to the Australian people because, honestly, um, you know, we are moving now towards recovery. We are looking to open up. We want to do that safely. We want to open up our borders, bring in tourists, travel, commerce, trade. You know, the fundamentals are that we have been on life support in a holding pattern, right, for the last 14 months, but we now need to bring Australia back, get her off life support, and get her flourishing again. So, you know, that confidence will come with the most efficacious vaccines for the population, not just for is, half is the population, fair, but for all of them. Only if we diminish confidence in the actual program. <laughs> I mean, I, th I, th I think what we've got to be very careful of, and as I said this at the start, is diminishing the confidence in the program by misquoting the evidence about efficacy of the vaccine that is stopping you getting COVID-19 and stopping you getting severe disease. All of the vaccines stop you from getting severe disease. That alone will allow our community to flourish. You can have a vaccine that's 100% effective. If no one's getting it, your vaccination program is 0% effective. So we need to use the vaccines we've got at the moment. We need to roll them out to as many Australians as we can, and that will actually give us the most successful outcome from this vaccination But, program. Nick, can we not <laughs> then pivot to Novavax, for example? I mean, you know, this is a vaccine with some really encouraging preliminary data. It's looking like it's 89%, right, based on a clinical trial, 15,000 people, three continents, um, and CSL can ma manufacture it. So why couldn't we pivot to that? And we have a pre-order uh, with Novavax. So I think it's a really, really good question. Um, the Novavax is in its um, latter stages of its phase three trials. It, it needs to be approved by the regulator. CSL's actually making AstraZeneca, not Novavax yeah. at the moment. And I don't know what it was like here in July last year and August last it was bad. year. It was bad. I can't feel how bad it was because I wasn't here. So I'm not going to, as someone who advises the government on public policy, sit here in the knowledge that I have vaccine but not give it to the people of Victoria because I'm waiting for something that I don't personally think is more effective. I don't want to put Victorians or anyone in Australia in that sort of risk. We have a vaccine that will protect us from what happened in Victoria last year. It's Pfizer, it's AstraZeneca, and we're going to use them.